Hello everyone. Uh, this time around, I want to talk about a storytelling device. Uh, now, the uh, particular one, uh, which is known as an unreliable narrator. Now, uh, most stories tend to be told with a, a third person omniscient or a third person limited omniscient uh, narrator. That's your stories that are told, you know, that always talk about he did this, they did that, she did the other thing. Uh, and the omniscient narrator can uh, step into anybody's head or step back and tell events from an objective perspective. Uh, the, the fully omniscient narrator knows everything about what's going on in the story and can tell you anything he chooses to tell you. On the, the other hand, the limited omniscient narrator will, uh, t will restrict himself to a single character's uh, sphere of uh, observation uh, or a, a limited set of characters' spheres of observation. And that is the things that those characters could reasonably be expected to know. And when the, the limited narrator is focusing on character X, he will only tell you things that character X has observed or knows or thinks. And when, when he's focusing on character Y, it doesn't matter what he knew when he was focusing on character X. When he's focusing on character Y, he's only aware of what character Y knows and sees and thinks. And this is actually uh, a very common method of storytelling because it can, it can keep the reader uh, focused on, what, uh, on what's going on. And it, it allows the narrator to build up mystery about what's going on by restricting the viewpoint to uh, one or more viewpoint characters. And well-chosen viewpoint characters make for a, a very dramatic uh, tale. And this is harder to achieve with a fully omniscient third-person narrator. And that is one of the, the reasons that the limited perspective is often employed. But that uh, omniscient third-person narrator, like off in the, in the ether or something, is it can still be employed to a great effect. And sometimes you'll have a, a, a normally limited narrator step back from all of the point of view characters and tell you something that crosses all of the points of view or it, which is outside of them. Uh, sometimes your omniscient or limited omniscient narrator will go by the name I and 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 so on. They basically use the I pronoun, uh, I and me, in the, in the tale. Sometimes that's because the the narrator is in fact a participant in the story, or the narrator happens to have an objective perspective on the story. But usually, when you have a first person narrator, you know, I and me are telling the story you'll have a limited perspective to the character that's the, that's talking to you. Uh, so you'll have a, a limited perspective to only what that the, the narrator, who happens to be the point of view character, knows and sees and thinks. That doesn't mean that the narrator won't uh, rely on information that is to come in the future. Uh, and so on, you know, especially for a story that's told in, in the past tense, which most stories in English are, uh, the, the narrator it can be assumed, whether, even if it is one of the participants in the, in the story that is telling the story, can be assumed to be telling the story at some point in the future, and therefore knows what is to come. So, uh, that uh, that historical uh, you know storytelling uh, mode in the past tense allows for temporal glitches, uh, so you can you have a little more information than the point of view character would have at that point in the story, 
uh, and it's, it can be used to great effect to jump forward. But most of the time, the, the story will restrict itself to what that point of view character knows. Now, most of the time in most stories, you have a reliable narrator who tells you the story as it happened correctly. Uh, which, as we all know, human memory is not that good, and people are not that good at telling telling uh, stories accurately, even if they do remember them accurately. So it's it's something of a conceit to do that, but it makes it easier for the reader to have an to assume that the narrator is telling the truth, and that is uh, giving you an accurate. Uh, a representation of the events. Whether it's colored by their perspective or not, that it's still at least an accurate representation of the events. But that's not the only way you can do this. You can have the narrator be completely unreliable. And that narrator might be that first person I and me narrator, but your third person narrator may also be unreliable, may also be uh, un misinformed about events or something like that. Uh, so let's look at some, some cases where uh, it would be reasonable to expect an unreliable narrator. Say you're reading somebody's diary as part of the story, like you've got a diary entry. Well, it's perfectly reasonable to have a very filtered perspective in there and that the, that character's perceptions of events may be unreliable. So it's not particularly surprising to find out that events recorded in a diary, for instance, are not recorded faithfully. And there's a lot of situations like that where, where you're reading, as, say, an account that exists within the story written by somebody with an agenda. Well, then you can assume that the, the narrator of that document is potentially unreliable because they're going to color what they, they tell you based on their agenda. And this doesn't tend to cause too much confusion or difficulty for the reader because they know that documents and so on within the universe may be unreliable, just like similar documents in the real world. But what if we take it one step further and have the narrator who's talking to us and telling us the story, have them be unreliable, have their recollections potentially be wrong, have their shading of the events make their telling not necessarily accurate. Then, how do we know that the story is unfolding the way we think it is? Well, the short answer is we don't. But this technique can be used to great effect. Uh, if you take a look at some examples, uh, well, one big example is really uh, encompassed by, by just mentioning the, the Rashomon plot, uh, which is basically you have a, a situation uh, where you've got several witnesses to an event and they're all telling their version of the events. And each one of them has personal motivations and uh, they have uh, goals that don't necessarily line up with the, with the others. Uh, basically, their motivations and desires and, and all of that will cloud what they tell, whether they tell the truth or not. And you don't know which of them is telling the truth and which of them isn't, or if any of them are, or if they're just misremembering things. You don't have any idea what's actually happened. You don't have an objective view of the events. Now, this is a, a situation where the characters in the story are telling, say, the investigator the various events, and the investigator has to decide at least 
to, uh, accurately enough what happened to decide who's guilty or what have you. So, for instance, if you're dealing with a murder, the guilty party will probably spin a yarn that either leads to them looking good or that their actions were justified or that they weren't even there or whatever and another will have a different perspective on the events and so on. Uh, this was done in a movie called Rashomon, uh, which was based on an old uh, Japanese uh, story. Uh, but the movie introduced the the uh, unreliable uh, narration bits, uh, uh, if I have my facts straight. But since then, the same technique has been used in other uh, other situations. For instance, in a in in the episode of Leverage called the Rashomon Job, we have uh, each of the main cast telling a story about what went on at a particular job uh, in the past before the team was together. And you'll get it for, first from one, one character's perspective, then you get it from another character's perspective, and you see the bits where the characters are in the same room or whatever at the same time. They're all, all different. The events where the characters... Uh, are on set together are different. That you see that uh, the first telling you have a stranger is a particular character in a crowd, and then you get a telling where you find out no, that stranger was actually this character on the team, and then you get the the telling and the events in that crowd scene are different, and so on. And and that's uh, and that's a really good use of the technique. Uh, but it's a fairly blatant use of the technique, and it's fairly obvious early on that that's what's going on, because you've got somebody in the story telling a story. There are, however, other uh, situations where this has been used to great effect, uh, and I've talked about one of them in the past, the Mr. Robot television series, where Elliot is telling us the story, especially in the first chunk of season one, most of season one, in fact, we see entirely from Elliot's perspective. And it starts out and it looks like a fairly typical, uh, you know, character narrating his life type story. And, and nothing seems hinky uh, until you realize that uh, you know, one bit of narration he talks about e-corporation, uh, E Corp, which he has programmed his mind to see as Evil Corp. And then everywhere you see uh, an E Corp installation, it says Evil Corp on screen. That's the first major clue that we're dealing with an unreliable narrator. And then as the, the series develops, the it becomes increasingly clear that Elliot, who's telling us the events, is not a reliable narrator. That what's going on probably doesn't quite match with what he's telling us. And, and sure enough, it does turn out that way. And then as we get more, more scenes where Elliot isn't present, we get scenes from other characters, we start to be able to notice that when those characters are the only ones on screen, we see the E Corp logo. But when Elliot's in there with them, we see Evil Corp and things like that. And it's done quite carefully and subtly through the course of that first season. And, and it allows the plot to develop uh, in a very suspenseful and a very suspenseful way and, and an engaging way because you basically you're along for the ride with Elliot as he realizes that things are not what he thinks they are and as he realizes that he is in fact an unreliable narrator so uh, as things move on and the reveals have that much more impact when you realize that you've been duped by the narrator. Even when the clues were there that something was going on. Uh, 
so uh, Mr. Robot, especially season one, is a very good example of unreliable narration, the unreliable narrator. But is there another, are there other situations where an unreliable narrator could be beneficial? Well, if you're telling a vast, sprawling epic, say, you know, like epic fantasy, epic space opera, whatever it is, you might want to consider restricted viewpoints and somewhat unreliable narration. And you want to establish that early on, that what you're seeing is definitely colored by the point of view character. Because if you do that, it can actually be used to great effect to cover your own screw-ups. Because then the reader won't know whether your error in describing a character is due to the point of view character making an error or because you, the author, made the error. So for a sprawling story where you've got lots of characters and lots of events going on all over the place, it might be very well worth considering having at least a somewhat unreliable narrator and make sure you have a, a set of point of view characters with different perspectives that see key events from slightly different angles so that the, the reader or the viewer can see uh, how the, the events don't quite line up, but the core of it is still there. And that's, that is the real utility of the somewhat un unreliable narrator, the unintentionally unreliable narrator, you know, the, the, the guy who's misremembering something that happened, things like that. Those can be very useful for wallpapering over errors on the part of the author. Because then, if you come along later on and you realize that you've got an event that didn't, that doesn't quite work the way it was originally written, you can carefully construct another view of that event that makes it look different to what the original account suggested without completely invalidating the initial account. And I think that can go a long way to uh, avoiding some of the cognitive dissonance that comes when a reader realizes that there is a substantial disconnect between two different events as described different times in a vast sprawling story. A good example of this type of disconnect is the the way things operate for uh, the character Tool in the in, in Erickson's Malazan Book of the Fallen between Volume One and the rest of the series, uh, where uh, a Tool had an effect that dampened magic if just from proximity in volume one, but it doesn't work that way anymore in volume two. Uh, now that's something that'd be very hard to retcon with uh, some sort of unreliable narration and some different descriptions of events. So that's definitely not the sort of thing that you're going to be using uh, an unreliable narrator to get out from under. But there's a lot of minor things where you have uh, an event that happens and the narrator told you there was five ships involved in a space battle. And later you find that you need to have a sixth ship having been involved somehow. Uh, and if you do it right, you can have it so that the original teller of the battle just didn't see that sixth ship or left it out deliberately or something like that. So you can actually, if you've established that the narrators are not completely reliable, that they're fallible, then you can get away with that sort of thing without having to have a lot of hand waving to explain why they might have deliberately left it out. When you can just fall back on, well, I guess it was an error in the account or something like that. Or the narrator just 
wasn't aware of it or got the number wrong or any number of things like that. So you can potentially use unreliable narrators to great effect to cover up uh, errors, especially in a sprawling story or a long running series or something like that. Uh, or you can use it as a great way to build suspense or to uh, to affect character interactions and so on, like in the Rashomon plot. Or you could just use it so you can keep the reader or viewer guessing. But I, you know, it's my considered opinion that the unreliable narrator isn't used nearly as often as it possibly should be or could be and I think it would be uh, quite beneficial overall especially to larger stories larger works to have some of that unreliable narration in there especially when you have multiple points of point of view characters because it adds flavor and it, and it can be used as, as a character development mechanism and all manner of things like that not just to establish suspense or keep the reader guessing. Anyway, uh, that's my ramble on unreliable narration for now. Uh, if you liked the video or you didn't, leave a like or a dislike. It won't bother me either way. I don't validate my myself by likes on YouTube. Uh, if you want to be notified of future videos, uh, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.